And then 24, humility of the heart based upon a keen sense of modesty. Humility of the heart. I don't know of anything as wonderful as to have true humility of the heart. Because, you know, when I think about criticizing anybody for anything now, yeah, and sometimes there are times when I do have to criticize people. Sometimes I have to criticize the people I'm working with. Some of them, not all of them. But always inside of me, maybe they don't hear it, but inside of me, I, you know, when I find it necessary for me to express disapproval of anything anybody does, I always say inside of me, well, God pity us all. And but for the grace of God, I'd be the man that I'm over there criticizing. And maybe I've done things that ten times as bad as the thing he, I'm criticizing him for. In other words, I try to maintain that sense of humility in my heart, regardless of what happens to me that's unpleasant. And regardless of how, the more successful I become, the more, hum, more I observe this uh, feeling of humility of the heart. Recognizing that after all, whatever success I have is due entirely to the friendly, marvelous love and affection and cooperation of other people. Because without that, I could never have spread myself over the world the way I have. I could never have benefited the people that I have. I could never have grown the way I have grown had it not been for the love and the affection and the marvelous, friendly cooperation of other people. And I couldn't have gotten that cooperation if I hadn't adjusted myself to other people in the state of friendliness. Last but not least, personal magnetism. That's, uh, that has uh, reference to the te- uh, sex emotion, of course. An inborn trait and the only one of the traits of personality which cannot be cultivated, but it can be controlled and directed to beneficial usage. As a matter of fact, the uh, most outstanding leaders, salesmen, speakers, uh, uh, clergymen, uh, lawyers, lecturers, teachers, most outstanding in every field of endeavor, as a matter of fact, are people who have learned to transmute sex emotion. That is to say convert that great creative energy over into doing the thing that you want to do most at the time being. And that word transmute is something to conjure with, something to look up in the dictionary until you make sure you understand what it means. Now, uh, you've got a lot of thinking to do about this, and uh, you're going to make discoveries about yourself. You're going to find out that when you really come down to answering these questions and giving yourself a rating, that uh, you have certain weaknesses that you didn't know you had and that you have certain strength and certain good qualities that you perhaps had under e- under value. Let's uh, find out about ourselves to see just where we stand, what it is that makes us tick, why people like us, why people dislike us. And I can take any one of you and sit down with you and by asking you, uh, I'll say not over 20 questions, I can, I can lay my finger right on what's keeping you from being popular if you are not popular. And you can do the same thing. That's what I want you to do. I want you to learn to analyze people, starting with yourself. Find out what it is that makes people popular, what it makes them tick. And uh, when you do that, you have one of the greatest assets that you could possibly imagine. Thank you very much. Well, the first half of the evening is devoted to going the extra mile. And of course, as you know, that means the rendering of more service and better service and you're paid to render, uh, doing it all the time and doing it in a pleasant, pleasing mental attitude. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons why there are so many failures in the world today is that the majority of people do not even go the first mile, let alone the second one. And oftentimes, if they do go the first mile, they gripe as they go along and make themselves a darn nuisance. No. People around. <laughs> I said darn nuisance. <laughs> I suppose you know the type. Of course, that doesn't apply to any of you, because if you were like that before you got into this philosophy, you're going to get over it very fast. I don't know of any one quality or trait that can get a person an opportunity quicker than to go out of his way, his way or her way to do somebody a favor, do something useful. Uh, it's the one thing that you can do in life that you don't have to ask anybody's privilege for, of doing it. As a matter of fact, uh, if you're going to be free and independent and uh, self-determining and uh, financially independent in old age, you might just as well make up your mind that you can never be that unless by a stroke of good luck, a rich uncle or a rich aunt dying or something of that sort, unless you uh, form the habit of going the extra mile and make yourself as near indispensable as you possibly can. I don't know of any way, any way that anybody can make himself or herself ind- uh, indispensable except by going the extra mile, by uh, rendering some sort of service that you're not expected to render and rendering, rendering it in the 
right sort of a mental attitude. Now that mental attitude is important. If you uh, gripe about uh, going the extra mile, uh, the chances are that it won't, uh, won't bring you very many returns. Now, uh, where do I get my authority, do you suppose, for emphasizing this principle of going the extra mile? What causes me to emphasize that? I get it by uh, looking around and watching the way nature does things. And any time that you can follow the, way, uh, the habits of nature, you're not going to go wrong. And uh, stated conversely, any time that you fail to recognize the way nature does things and do not go along, you're going to get into trouble sooner or later. Just a question of time. Because you do have, there is an overall plan in which this universe operates. And uh, no matter what you call the first cause of that plan, or the operator of it, or the creator of it, no matter what you call that, there is there's just one plan, there's just one set of natural laws, and it's up to every individual to discover what those natural laws are and adjust himself favorably to them. And certainly, if there is one thing that stands out above all others in nature, it is that nature requests and demands that every living thing go the extra mile in order to eat, in order to live, in order to survive. Man wouldn't survive one season if it were not for this law of going the extra mile. Don't render service, a uh, million dollars worth of service a day and then expect to go and get a bank uh, check for it tomorrow. <laughs> In other words, if you start out to render a million dollars worth of service, you perhaps have to render a little bit at a time and you'll have to get yourself uh, recognized. And while you're going through that period of recognition, the chances are that uh, you'll not be compensated for going the extra mile. Chances are you'll have to go the extra mile quite a little while before anybody takes notice of you. But always be careful that you don't go the extra mile too long without somebody taking notice of you. And if the right fellow doesn't take notice, look around until you find the right fellow who will. That's about the equivalent of saying if your present employer doesn't recognize you, if you work for an employer, why fire the employer sooner or later and uh, let, his, let his competitor know what kind of service you're rendering. It won't hurt your chances a bit. I'll assure you it won't. Have a little competition as you go along. Now, uh, now nobody ever accepts a rule or does anything without a motive and I have outlined here in this lesson a great variety of reasons why you should go the extra mile. I'm going to make comments on them. Now what do I mean by the law of increasing returns? Benefits. Benefits, yes. Well, substantially, the law of increasing returns means that you'll get back more than you give out, whether it's good or whether it's bad, whether it's positive or whether it's negative, and that's the way the law of nature works. Whatever you give out, whatever you do to or for another person, or whatever you give out from yourself comes back to you, multi greatly multiplied, in kind. No, no, no exception to that whatsoever. Again, there is the question of timing. The coming back process doesn't always come back very quickly. Sometimes it's uh, longer than you expect. But you may be sure that if you send out some negative influence, that it's going to come back on you sooner or later, and you may not recognize uh, what caused it, but uh, it'll come back. It won't overlook you. That law of increasing returns is eternal. It's uh, automatic. It's working all the time. And it's just as uh, inexorable as the law of gravitation. There's nobody in the world that can circumvent it or go around it or have it suspended for one moment. It's operating all the time. The law of increasing returns means that when you uh, go out of your way to render more service and better service than you're paid to render, it's impossible for you not to get back more than you really did because eventually that law of increasing returns takes care of that. If you're working for a salary, for instance, it takes care of it in additional wages, in greater responsibilities, in promotions, in opportunities that will come to you to go into business for yourself. In a thousand and one different ways it will come back and oftentimes this uh, coming back process doesn't uh, come back from the source to which you render the service. Don't be too afraid to render service to a greedy buyer or to a, greeter, a greedy employer. It makes no difference to whom you render this service. You, if you render it in good faith and in good spirit and keep on doing it as a matter of habit, it's just as impossible for you not to be compensated as it is to be and not to be at the same time. Well, that law of increasing returns. Now, just remember that when you start applying this principle, that you don't have to be too careful about the person whom you render it. As a matter of fact, what you should really do is to apply this principle with everybody you come into contact, no matter who it is. Strangers and acquaintances and business associates and relatives alike. 
Make it your business to render useful service wherever you touch human relations in any shape, form, or fashion. Because uh, the only way that you can increase your, uh, the space that you occupy in the world, and by the space that you occupy, I don't mean necessarily the physical space, but the mental and spiritual, spiritual space as well, will be determined by the quality and the quantity of the service that you render. The quality and the quantity plus the mental attitude in which you render. Now, those are the determining factors as to how far you'll go in life, how much you'll get out of life, how much you'll enjoy life, and how much peace of mind you'll have. And next, it uh, brings one to the favorable attention of those who can and often do provide opportunities for self-promotion. The favorable attention of people. You'll go into any organization and... If you're alert-minded and take notice, you'll find out who the people are that are going the extra mile. You'll find out very quickly. And also, if you watch the uh, procedure and the records of those people who are going the extra mile, you'll find that they're the one, when there are promotions around, they're the ones that get the promotions. They don't have to ask for them. It's not necessary at all. Because the employers are just naturally looking around for people who will go the extra mile. And next, it tends to permit uh, one to become indispensable in many different human relationships and therefore enables one to command more than the average compensation. But I'll tell you one thing that's not in my notes that it does, <clears throat> and I want you to know this. It does something to your soul inside of you. It makes you feel better. And if it didn't do a single, if there's not another reason in the world why you should go the extra mile, I'd say that would be adequate. You know, there are a lot of things in, in life that to cause us to have uh, negative feelings, cause us uh, unpleasant uh, experiences and feelings, a lot of things in life. This is one thing that you can do for yourself that will always give you a pleasant feeling. And if you go back in your own experiences, I'm sure that you'll remember that you never did a kind thing for anybody, that you didn't get a great deal of joy of it. Maybe the other fellow didn't appreciate it. That, that's in, unimportant. It's just like love. Uh, you, to have loved has alone is a great privilege and it doesn't make any difference whatsoever whether your love is returned by the other person you've had the benefit by the the emotion of love itself and so it is by the principle of going the extra mile it'll do something to you it'll give you greater courage it'll enable you to overcome inhibitions and uh, inferiority complexes that you've been storing up back down through the years just this stepping out and making yourself useful to somebody and don't be too surprised when um, you do something courteous or useful for somebody that, who's not expecting it and they look at you with a, in a quizzical sort of way as much as to say, well, uh, I just wa wonder why you're doing that. <laughs> Some people will be a little bit uh, surprised when you go out of your way to be useful to them. Also, it leads to mental growth and physical perfection in various forms of service, thereby developing greater ability and skill in one's chosen vocation. You know, delivering a lecture or making up your notebook or filling your job, whatever it is in, that you do in life that you're going to repeat, make up your mind that every time you do it, you will excel all previous efforts on your part. In other words, you, you're, you're a constant challenge to yourself. And you'll find how quickly and how rapidly you will grow if you'll go at it in that way. I have never delivered a lecture in my life that I didn't intend to deliver it better than I did previously. I don't always do it, but that's my intention. And it makes no difference what kind of an audience I have, whether I have a big class or a small class. I don't often have small classes, but sometimes I have had small classes. But I put just as much into a small class as a big one. Not alone because I want to be useful to my students, but because I want to grow and I want to develop. And out of effort, out of struggle, out of use of your faculties comes growth. And then <clears throat> it enables one to profit by the law of contrast. Had you ever thought about that? And uh, I'll tell you right now, you won't have to advertise that one very much because it'll advertise itself. Because the majority of people around you are not going to be going the extra mile. And that's all to the good for you. Now, if everybody went the extra mile, this would be a grand world to live in, but you couldn't cash in on this principle as definitely as you can now, because you'd have a tremendous amount of competition. But don't worry, you're not going to have it. I can assure you you're not. Practically be in the class by yourself. Now, there will be some cases, perhaps, where people with whom you're working or with whom you're associated will be showing up 
for not uh, going the first mile, let alone the second one, and they won't like it. Now, of course, you're going to cry about that one and quit and go back to your old habits just because the other fellow doesn't like what you're doing. Or are you? Of course not. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it's your individual responsibility in this world to succeed. That's your sole responsibility. And you can't afford to let anybody's ideas or idiosyncrasies or notions get in the way of your success. You can't afford to do that. You should be fair, you should be just with other people, but beyond that, you're under no obligations to let anybody's opinion or idea stop you from going out and being successful. I'd like to see the person that could stop me from being successful. I'd just love to take a look at him, see what he looked like. And I want you to feel that way about it, too. I want you to make up your mind that you're going to put into these laws into operation and that you're not going to let anybody stop you from doing it. Also, it leads to the development of a positive, pleasing mental attitude, which is among the more important traits of a pleasing personality. Not among, not among the more important, it is the most important one. As a matter of fact, it's the first trait of a pleasing personality, as you will see when you get to that lesson. A positive mental attitude. Isn't it a marvelous thing to know what you can do to change the chemistry of your brain so that you're positive instead of negative? Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that you can do that so easily? How? Why, by getting in that frame of mind where you want to do something useful to the other fellow without uh, rendering service with one hand and picking his pocket with the other while you're doing it. Doing it just because of the goodness that you get out of doing it, knowing that eventually, if you render more service and better service than you're paid to render, sooner or later you will be paid for more than you do and paid willingly. That's the way the law works. That's the law of compensation. And that, that's an eternal law. It never, it never forgets. It has a perfectly marvelous bookkeeping system. And uh, you may be sure that when you're giving out the right kind of service and the right kind of a mental attitude, that you're piling up credits for you somewhere that will come back to you multiplied sooner or later. Also, it uh, tends to develop a keen, alert imagination. <clears throat> because it is a habit which keeps one continuously seeking new and more efficient ways of rendering useful service. Now that's an important thing, isn't it? It develops your imagination, because you begin to look around to see how, how many places, how many ways and means there are of helping other people to find themselves. And in helping the other fellow to find himself, you find yourself. Incidentally, I, one of the most outstanding things that I discovered in the, my research was that when you have a problem, or an unpleasant situation and you don't know how to solve it, you've done everything you know, you've tried every source that you know anything about and you're still at a stalemate, there is always one thing that you can do. And if you'll do that one thing, the chances are that you not only will solve your problem, but you'll learn a great lesson. What is that one thing that you can do? When find somebody who has an equal or a greater problem and start where you stand, then and there, to help that other person. And lo and behold, it unlocks in you something. Some uh, cells of the brain, it unlocks some cells that permits infinite intelligence to come into your brain and give you the answer to the solution of your problem. Now, I don't know why that works, but do you know, the, do you know how I know that it does work? Do you know why I can make that statement so positive and not qualified? Do you know how I arrived at that decision? By trying it out hundreds and hundreds of times myself. And by seeing it tried out by hundreds and hundreds of times by my students whom I have recommended to do that same thing. What a simple thing that is. I don't know what it does to you. I don't know why it works. A lot of things in life I don't know. A lot of things you don't know, and some that you do know that you don't do much about. Now, this is one of them that I don't know anything about, but I do something about. I follow the law because I know that if I, if I, if I need my own mind to be opened up to receive opportunity, the best way in the world to open it up is to start looking around to see how many other people I can help. And also, it uh, develops that important factor of personal initiative, you know, uh, gets you into the habit of looking around for something useful to do and going out and doing it without somebody telling you to do it. And that's a mighty important thing. You know, pro that old man procrastination is a, he's a sour old, 
old bird, and he causes a lot of trouble in this world. People putting off things until day after tomorrow, which they should have done the day before yesterday. And we're all guilty of it, every one of us. I'm not free of it, I know, and I know you're not. But I'm, not, I'm freer of it than I was a few years back, I'll tell you that. I can find a lot of things to do now. Why do I find them? Because I get joy out of doing them. And any time you're going the extra mile, you're going to get joy out of what you're doing. Otherwise, you won't be going the extra mile. And it's going to develop this quality of uh, personal initiative and over help you overcome this uh, quality of procrastination. It also serves to build uh, the confidence of others in one's integrity and general ability. And it aids one in mastering the destructive habit of procrastination. It develops definiteness of purpose without which one cannot hope for success. That alone would be enough to justify it. It develops definiteness of purpose. It gives you an objective so that you don't go round and round in circles like a goldfish in a bowl, always coming back to where you started with nothing that you t didn't start out with. Definiteness of purpose comes out of this business of going the extra mile. And I'll tell you another thing that does. That's not in my notes. It enables you to um, make your work a joy instead of a burden. In other words, you get to where you love it. And I think maybe that if you're not engaged in the labor of love in life, you're uh, wasting a lot of your time. I think one of the greatest joys in the world is one's being permitted to engage in the thing that he would rather do than all other things. And surely when you're going the extra mile, you're doing just exactly that because you don't have to do it. Nobody expects you to do it. Nobody asks you to do it. Certainly no employer would ask his employees to go the extra mile. Oh, he might ask uh, to help out once in a while, but as a regular thing, he wouldn't do that. So it's uh, something that you do on your own initiative, and it gives you, it gives uh, dignity to labor. It gives dignity, even if you're doing nothing but digging a ditch, and you're doing it because you're helping somebody, you have a certain dignity attached to that, that ticks the fatigue and the unpleasantness out of the labor. What is the most uh, important application you ever made in your life of this business of going the extra mile out of which you got the greatest amount of joy? Now think hard, please. Tell me. Being what? Being married. Being married? Well, that's getting pretty hot. <laughs> How about before getting married? Yeah. Believe me, I've spent a lot of time <laughs> burning midnight oil and later than that. And I didn't consider it hard work at all. Also, it was my own idea. <laughs> I'd only use my initiative, but I got a lot of joy out of doing it. And I made it pay off. Marvelous thing, how long you can go when you're courting the girl of your choice or being courted by the man of your choice. Marvelous how much sleep you can lose and still not <laughs> be seriously hurt by it. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you could put the same attitude into your relations with people professionally or in the business that you put into, your, uh, into courtship? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And wouldn't this be a wonderful world to live in? We're going to start back sparking again. <laughs> it's going to start at home with our own mates. Believe me, I, I couldn't begin to tell you the number of married couples that I've started in on a new sparking spree. And a lot of joy out of it. Saves a lot of friction, a lot of argument. Cuts down expenses. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Do you good. Now, I, I don't mean to be facetious, facetious about this. I mean, I'm very serious about it when I say that there is one of the finest places in the world to start going the extra mile. When you start going the extra mile with somebody that you haven't been going with, sit down and have a little, uh, little sales talk with them. Just tell them that you've uh, changed your attitude and uh, you want a mutual agreement for both parties to change the attitude. Now, from here on out, all of us are going the extra mile. We're going to relate ourselves to, uh, together on a different basis where we'll all get joy out of it and get more peace of mind and more happiness in living. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you went home tonight and uh, had that kind of a speech with your mate? <laughs> Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing? It wouldn't hurt. It might help. Now, the mate might not be uh, impressed by it, but you will be. <laughs> Nothing to hinder you from enjoying it. And that person in business that you haven't been getting along so well with, now, if you went in tomorrow morning with a smile and walked over to him or her and took his hand or 
and shook hands and said, Now, listen, pal, from here on out, let you and I enjoy working together. What did you say? <laughs> Wouldn't work, huh? Oh, yes, it would. <laughs> oh, yes, it would. You try it and see. Try it and see. You know, there's a little thing that we have called pride, and if there's one thing that does more damage in this world than any other one, it's that little thing called pride. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to humiliate yourself if it's going to be a little better human relations with the people that you have to associate with all the time. Thank you. Also, going the extra mile is the only thing which gives one the right to ask for promotions or more pay. Did you ever stop to think about that? You don't have a leg to stand on in going into the purchaser of your services and asking for more money or for a promotion to a better job unless for some time previously you have been going the extra mile, doing more than you're paid for. Because obviously if you're doing no more than you're paid for, then you're being paid for all you're entitled to, aren't you? Certainly you are. So you have to first start going the extra mile and putting the other fellow under obligation to you before you can ask any favors of him. And I'll tell you another thing. If you have enough people whom you have put under obligations to you by going the extra mile, when you need some favor, you can always turn in one direction or other and get it. It's a nice thing to know that you have that kind of credits uh, hanging around, isn't it? I want you to have that kind of credits with other people. And I want to teach you the technique by which you can do that. Now, uh, we get our cue as to the soundness of the principle of going the extra mile by observing nature. And here's quite a bit of illustration regarding that. You see that nature goes the extra mile by producing enough of everything for her needs together with an overplus for emergencies and waste. It blooms on the trees. The fish is in the seas, in the waters. She doesn't just produce enough fish to perpetuate the species. She produces enough to feed the snakes and the alligators and everything else and those that die of natural causes and still enough to perpetuate the species. Nature is most bountiful in her business of going the extra mile and in return she is very demanding in seeing that every living creature goes the extra mile. Bees are provided with honey as compensation for their services in fertilizing the flowers in which the honey is attractively stored. But they have to perform the service to get the honey and it must be performed in advance. Nature, you've heard it said that the birds of the air and the beasts of the jungle neither weave nor spin, but they always live and eat. But you know if you observe wildlife at all, they don't eat without performing some sort of service, without working, without doing something before they can eat. Take a flock of common old cornfield crows, for instance. They have to organize, they have to have sentinels to put down for their protection. They travel in flocks. They have sentinels, they have codes by which to warn one another. They have to do a lot of educating before they can even eat safely. And uh, nature requires man to go the extra mile. He's got to go out and uh, if he's going to have food, all food comes out of the ground. And if he's going to have food, he's got to plant seed. He can't live entirely on what nature plants. Not in civilized life he can't, at least. Over on the islands where some places were not civilized, I suppose they depend on eating raw coconuts and what have you. But in civilized life, we have to plant our food in the ground. We have to clear the ground first. We have to plow it. We have to harrow it. We have to fence it. We have to protect it against uh, predatory animals and so forth. And all of that costs labor and time and money. And all of that has to be done in advance or you're not going to eat. I wouldn't have any trouble at all selling this idea that nature makes everybody go the extra mile to a farmer. He knows that beyond any question of a doubt. He knows every minute of his life that if he doesn't go the extra mile, he doesn't eat. He doesn't have anything to sell. A new employee, for instance, going into a new job can't come right in immediately and start going the extra mile and uh, immediately demand uh, top wages or the best job in the place. You just don't, it doesn't work out that way. You have to establish a record, a reputation. You have to get yourself recognized and uh, received. In this business of going the extra mile, before you can begin to put pressure on to get compensation back. 
As a matter of fact, if you go the extra mile in the right sort of mental attitude, the chances are a thousand to one you'll never have to ask for compensation according to the service you render because it'll be, it'll be attended you automatically in the way of promotions, in the way of increased salary. And uh, throughout the whole universe, everything has been so arranged uh, through the law of compensation, so adequately described by Emerson, that nature's budget is balanced, so to speak. Everything has its opposite equivalent in something else. Positive and negative in every unit of energy, day and night, hot and cold, success and failure, sweet and sour, happiness and misery, man and woman. Everywhere and everything, one may see the law of action and reaction in operation. Everything you do, everything you think, every thought that you release causes a reaction. If not on somebody else, on the person releasing the thought. Because you never, as a matter of fact, when you release a thought, you're not through with it. Every thought that you uh, express, silently even, becomes a definite part of the pattern of your subconscious mind. And if you, re if you store in that subconscious mind enough, enough negative thoughts, you'll be predominantly negative. And if you uh, follow the habit of uh, releasing only the positive thoughts, your subconscious pattern will be predominantly positive. And you will attract to you the things, all of the things that you want. And if you're negative, you'll repel the things that you want and attract only the things you don't want. That's a law of nature, too. And this business of going the extra mile is one of the finest ways that I know of of educating your subconscious mind to attract to you the things you want and to repel the things you don't want. And you can put it down as an established fact that if you neglect to develop and apply this principle of going the extra mile, you will never become personally successful and you will never become financially independent. The reason I happen to know it sound is, you see, I've had a great privilege over you that you haven't had yet, but you will have in time. I had the privilege of observing a great many thousands of people some of whom applied the principle of going the extra mile and some of whom did not. And I have had the uh, privilege of finding out what happened to those who did and those who didn't. And I know beyond any question of a doubt that uh, nobody ever rises above ordinary or stations in life or mediocrity without the habit of going the extra mile. It just doesn't happen. If I had discovered one case, just one case, where somebody went on to the top Without going the extra mile, I would say then there are exceptions, but I am in position to say there are no exceptions because I have never found that one case. And I can definitely tell you from my own experiences, and I have been there every minute of my life, that I have never had a major benefit of any kind in the world that I didn't get it as a result of going the extra mile. Now that's the thing that I want you to do. I want you to become self-determining so you can do these things without the help of anybody. That's the time when the payoff will come to you, when you can go out and do anything in this world that you want to do, and whether anybody wants you to do it or whether they want to help you or whether they don't, you can do it on your own. I want to tell you that's one of the grandest, most glorious feelings that I know anything about, knowing that as I stand here talking to you, that whatever I wanted to do, I can do it. I don't have to ask anybody. Not even my wife. <laughs> but if I had to ask her, I would, because <laughs> I'm on good terms with her. <laughs>
Now, do you know what I do instead of uh, finding out what's wrong with the rest of the world? Do you know how I put in my time? Find out what's wrong with him. Yes, I try to find out what I can do to correct this guy here. That I have to, I have to eat with him, I have to sleep with him, I have to shave his face every morning, I have to wash his face, I have to give him a bath now and then. <laughs> Why, you know, I have no idea how many things I have to do for him. And I have to live with the guy, 24 hours a day. <laughs> So I put in my time trying to improve myself and through myself trying to improve my friends and my students by writing books and by delivering lectures and by teaching and by, in other ways. And you know it pays off very much better than it would if I sat down and took the old trib or any of the papers and read all of the murder stories, all of the divorce scandals and everything that blazoned across the pages every day. So I'm still talking about this fellow in Napoleon Hill who didn't have sense enough not to decline Andrew Carnegie's offer to work 20 years for nothing. In his declining years uh, will be uh, years of happiness because of the seeds of kindness and help you home in the hearts of others. I, that's a wonderful thing. You know, if I had my life to live over again, I'd live it just exactly the way I have. I'd make all the mistakes I had made. I'd make them at the time in life when I made them, back early, so I'd have time enough to correct some of them. And that period during which I would uh, come into peace of mind and understanding would be in the afternoon of life, not in the forenoon. Because I, I can stand it. I can take it. When you're young, you can take it. But when you pass the uh, noon hour and you go into the afternoon, why, uh, your energies are not as great oftentimes as they were before. Your physical energy, sometimes your mental capacity is not as great. And you can't take as much trouble as you can in your days of youth. And you haven't got so many years left to correct the mistakes that you make. So... To have the tranquility and the peace of mind that I have today in the uh, afternoon of life is one of the great joys that has come out of this philosophy. And if you ask me what has been my greatest compensation, I would say that's it. Because there's so many people at my age, and even much younger than I, who haven't found peace of mind and never will. They never will. Because they're looking for it in the wrong place. They're not doing anything about it. They're expecting somebody else to do something about it for them. And that peace of mind is something that you've got to get for yourself. You've got to earn it, first of all. That's how anybody can get peace of mind. And you'd be surprised where you have to really start looking for it. Not where the average person is looking for it, out there in the joys of what money will buy, out there in the joys of uh, recognition and fame and fortune and what have you. Not there. But in the humility of the one individual's own heart. I get peace of mind mostly in that third inner wall that I described to you, where the wall is as high as eternity, where I go in for meditation many times each day. There's where I get my real peace of mind. Now, I can always withdraw into that inner wall, cut out every earthly influence, and commune with the higher forces of the universe. What a grand thing that is. And anybody can do that. You can do that. When you get through this philosophy, you'll be able to do anything you want to do, just as well or better than anything that I can do. And I'm hoping, incidentally, that I'll Every student that I turn out will eventually excel me in every way that I know possible. Maybe in writing books. Maybe you'll take up where I left off and write better books than I wrote. Why not? There's no, I haven't said the last word in my books, nor in my lectures, or in anything else. Matter of fact, I'm just a student. Just a student. I think I'm a fairly intelligent student, but just a student on the path. And the only state of perfection that I have is that I have actually found peace of mind and how to get it. Engage in at least one act of going the extra mile every day. Now, you can choose your own circumstance if it is nothing more than telephoning an acquaintance and wishing him good fortune. Uh, you'll be surprised what will happen to you uh, when you begin to call up your friends uh, that you have been neglecting for some time and just uh, say, well, hello, I got the I, you were on my mind. I was thinking about you. I just wanted to call up and say, how do you do? And I hope you are feeling as good as I am. You'd be surprised how, uh, what that'll do to you and what it'll do to the friend, too. And it doesn't have to be a close personal friend. It just has to be somebody you, you know. Or you may relieve some friend from duty for half an hour or so or have some neighbor send over his children while he attends the movies or you might do a little babysitting for one of your neighbors. You're going to be at home anyway. Maybe you've got some children of your own. Maybe you know some neighbor that uh, would like to get off and go down to the movies, but she can't get away from her children. Oh, I know, the children are noisy, and they probably fight with your children. But if you're a real diplomat, you'll uh, keep them apart. She'll be under obligations to you, and you'll feel that you've really been kind by helping out somebody who otherwise wouldn't have had a little freedom. 
So uh, it'd be a nice thing for some of you people who don't have any children to say, well, I'll go, good night, come over and babysit for you while you go out. You and your, why don't you and your husband go on a little courtship, go out to the movie, go to a show, and let me come over and babysit for you? Well, of course, uh, you have to know your neighbors pretty well in order to do that. Well, certainly, most of you would have some neighbor that uh, you could approach on some such basis as that, and they wouldn't think you were crazy. <laughs> It's not so much what you do to the other fellow, that uh, it's what you do to yourself by finding ways and means of going the extra mile. In little ways. Did you know that the, uh, both the successes in life and the failures are made up of little things? Very little things. So little, in fact, that oftentimes they're overlooked. The real reasons for success is overlooked because the things that make success are so such small in seemingly insignificant things. I know some people so popular, they couldn't have an enemy. They just couldn't have an enemy. And one of them is my distinguished business associate, Mr. Stone. All of his going the extra mile. And look how prosperous he is. Look how many people are going the extra mile from him. There are a lot of people who, if they didn't uh, make good money working for Mr. Stone, if they had to do it, they'd pay him a salary to work for him. And I know, I heard one say just that. And he's become immensely wealthy himself, working for Mr. Stone. He said, if I... If I didn't make money out of working for him, I'd pay him if I had to, just for association with him. Now, Mr. Stone's not different from you or me or anybody else, except in his mental attitude toward people, toward himself. He makes it his business to go the extra mile. Sometimes people take advantage of that. Don't act fairly with him. I've seen that happen, too. He doesn't worry about that too much. In fact, he doesn't worry about anything at all, period. <laughs> Because he's learned to adjust himself to life in such a way that he gets great joy out of living, gets great joy out of people. <clears throat> or you may write a letter to some acquaintance offering him encouragement. In your job, you may do a little more than you're paid to do. Stay a little longer on the job, make some other person a little more happy. Thank you very much. I want to introduce you to the most wonderful person in the world. That's the person sitting in your seat right now. And when you commence to break down that person point by point, well, in accordance with these 25 factors that go to make a pleasing personality, you'll find out just exactly why you're wonderful and why. And I'm going to ask you as I go along, <clears throat> grade yourself, the rating that you think you're entitled to, and it can be anything from zero to 100%. Then when you get through, add up the total and divide it by the 25 traits, and that'll give you your average rating on the pleasing personality. And if you rate all the way through a, 50, uh, a general rating of 50%, you're doing very fine. Some of you rate much higher than that, I hope. Now, the first uh, trait of a pleasing personality always is a positive mental attitude, because nobody wants to be around a person who's negative, and uh, no matter what other traits you may have, if you don't have a positive mental attitude, at least when you're in the presence of people, you're not going to be considered to, to have a pleasing personality. Now rate yourself on that anywhere from zero to uh, 100. If you can rate 100 on that, you'll be up in the class with Franklin D. Roosevelt. <laughs> That's pretty high. And the next one is on flexibility. Now, that mean, what do I mean by flexibility? I mean the, uh, the ability to unbend, to adjust yourself to the varying circumstances of life without going down under them. You know, there are a lot of people in this world who are so stayed in their habits and in their mental attitude that they cannot adjust to anything that's unpleasant or anything that, doesn't, that they don't agree with. Do you know why Franklin D. Roosevelt was one of the most, if not the most popular president we've had in our generation? Because he could be all things to all people. I've been in his office when senators and congressmen would come in there ready to cut his throat and they'd go out uh, wanting to, uh, singing his praises. Just because of the mental attitude in which he received. In other words, he adjusted himself uh, to their mental attitude and he didn't get mad at the same time the other fellow did. That's a mighty good way of adjusting Sue incidentally, is to learn to be flexible enough not to get mad when the other fellow's mad. If you want to get mad, do it on your own account when the other fellow's in a good humor and you'll have a much better chance of, of not getting hurt. <laughs> Flexibility. I've seen presidents of the United States come and go. I've been associated with several of them. And I know what this uh, 
factor of flexibility can mean in the highest office in the world. Herbert Hoover probably was one of the best business executives, best all-round executives we've ever had in the White House. And yet he couldn't possibly sell himself to the people a second time because he was inflexible. He could not bend. He was too static, too fixed. Calvin Coolidge was the same way. And uh, Woodrow Wilson, to some extent, was the same way. He was too austere, too static, too fixed, too correct. In other words, he wouldn't allow anybody to slap him on the shoulder, to call him Woody, or take any uh, personal liberties with him uh, at all. Because there's so many things in this life that you have to adjust yourself to temporarily if you're going to have peace of mind and good health, that you might just as well start in now learning to do it. And if you're not flexible, you can become flexible. Number three, on the pleasing tone of voice. Now, there's an important thing that you can experiment with. A lot of people have harsh tones. They talk, they have nasal tones, and they put that something into the tone of voice that irritates other people. You take any monotonous speaker, for instance, does not have personal magnetism, does not know how to uh, uh, give pitch and tone to his voice, and uh, he'll never get his audience you know, in a million years if he tries. You've got to learn to, uh, if you're going to teach, if you're going to lecture, if you're going to do public speaking, or even in good conversation, you've got to learn to uh, give a pleasant, pleasing tone to your tone of voice. And if you, uh, if you can't do that now, you can do it by a little bit of practice. Oftentimes, uh, by simply lowering your voice, not talking too loudly. You can give it that something that uh, is pleasing to the ear. I don't think that anybody can teach another person how to make his uh, tone of voice pleasing. I think you have to do that yourself. You have to do it by experimenting. But first of all, before you do it, you have to feel pleasing. How could you use a pleasant tone of voice when you felt angry, for instance? <laughs> or when you didn't like a person that you were talking to? How could you do it? Well, you can, but it's not too effective unless you really feel inside of you the way you're expressing yourself. Now, all those are things, they're, they're carefully studied techniques that you have to acquire if you're going to make yourself pleasing. And consequently, uh, I don't know if anything will pay off better than to be pleasing in the eyes of other people. It's just one of those things that you can't get along without. Tolerance. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand the full meaning of tolerance. That means an open mind on all subjects toward all people at all times. An open mind. In other words, your mind's not closed against anybody or anything. You're always willing to hear the last word or to hear an additional word about anything. Now, you'd be surprised at how few people there are in this world with open minds. Some of them are close to tight. You couldn't open them with a crowbar. You couldn't get a new idea in there if you tried. Well, uh, did you ever see one of those people who, were, who was pleasy? You never did and you never will. Have a pleasant, uh, pleasing at mental attitude, you've got to have an open mind because the very minute people find that you have prejudices that involve them and in their understanding of religion or politics or economics or anything else, the very minute they find out that you have, uh, have a closed mind toward any of these things that affect them, they're going to back away from you. Do you have any idea why it is that I can have all of the followers of all religions in my classes and, and get along well with all of them, Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Gentiles, all the races, all the creeds? Do you know why it is? You love them all. That's right. That's right. To me, they're all of one brand. They're my fellow beings. They're my brothers and sisters. That's why I get along with them. I never thought, I think of anybody in terms of what he believes politically or religiously or economically. I think of him in terms of what, he, what he's trying to do to better himself and to better somebody else. That's the terms that I think of people in, and that's why I get along so well with them. I didn't used to do that. An open mind. What a marvelous thing it is to be able to be in possession of yourself so you can keep your mind open. And if you don't keep it open, you're not going to learn very much. If you have a closed mind, you'll, uh, you'll find that you'll, uh, you'll uh, miss out on a lot of information, a lot of facts that you need that you couldn't get without an open mind. And then something that does to you inside, have your mind closed up against anybody or anything, say that you have the last word, you don't want any more information. That's the, that means you've ceased to grow. The very moment you close your mind on any subject, say that's the last word, I want no more information on it, then you cease to grow. A keen sense of humor. Now, uh, what I mean by keen sense of humor is you have to 
have a disposition. If you don't have it, you have to cultivate it so that you can adjust yourself to all of these unpleasant things that come along in life without uh, taking them too seriously. I think I told you about the uh, motto that I saw in the office of Dr. Frank Crane once. They impressed me very much, and especially finding it in the office of a preacher. It says, don't take yourself too damn seriously. <laughs> and he explained to me what that word damn mean. He said it meant just exactly what it said. <laughs> if you take yourself too seriously, you are go damning yourself. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? Yeah. So it wasn't a profane word after all. And I liked it. I like it. I still like it. I think it's a good motto for anybody, not to take himself too seriously. And incidentally, one of the finest tonics that you can take is to have a good laugh at least several times a day. A good heart of that. If you don't have anything to laugh at, cook up something. Look at yourself in the glass, for instance. <laughs> you can always get a laugh out of that. And you, you, you'd be surprised at how to change the chemistry of your mind right while you're doing it. And if you've got troubles, why, they'll melt away and they won't seem near as big when you're laughing as when you're crying. Keen sense of humor. What a marvelous thing it is. I don't know that my sense of humor is what you'd call keen, but it's alert. <laughs> I, can, I can get some fun out of almost any circumstance in life. I used to get a lot of punishment out of some circumstances that I now get fun out of because I've oiled up and made my sense of humor a little bit more alert than I used to be. Then, next, the frankness of manner and speech. With discriminate control of the tongue at all times, based upon the habit of thinking before you speak. Now, most people don't do that. They speak first and think or regret afterwards. <clears throat> what a wonderful thing it is in your conversation, for instance, if you just... Uh, before you utter any kind of an expression to anybody, figure out whether it's going to benefit the person that's listening or damage him. Whether it's going to benefit you or damage you. And if you just follow those two simple rules, I, I would say that half of the things that you say that you wish you hadn't said, you will never say them. If you do a little weighing and a little thinking before you open your mouth and start speaking. You know, there are a lot of people who set their mouths going and go off and leave them. And they forget what they <laughs> said because they weren't there. <laughs> And they're almost always in difficulty with somebody. Frankness of manner and speech. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to tell everybody exactly what you think of him, because if you do that, you'll have no friends. But frankness, not being evasive, not engaging in double talk. Nobody likes a double talker. Nobody likes a person who's always evasive and never has a, never expressed an opinion about anything. And uh, then number seven, pleasing facial expression. Now, you know, if you study your uh, facial expression in the mirror, it's a marvelous thing to see how much more pleasing you can make your facial expression when you try than when you don't try. By smiling a little bit. It's a marvelous thing to learn to smile when you're talking to people. You'll be surprised at how much more effective what you say is when you're smiling than when you're frowning or when you're looking serious. That makes a tremendous difference on the person that's listening. I hate to talk to a person who's uh, got a serious expression on as if the whole world is on his shoulders. It does, well, it makes me fidgety. I just wish that whatever he's saying, he'd get through with it and go on. But if he limbers up like Franklin D. Roosevelt used to and uh, gives you that old million dollar smile, why, uh, even the most trivial thing that he says sounds like music, sounds like wisdom, because uh, what he does to you um, uh, psychologically, that smile is a marvelous thing. Don't grin at people when you don't mean it, because monkeys can grin. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> but learn to, learn to smile because you feel it. Not, where does a smile take place first? On your lips or face or where? In your heart, where you feel it. That's where it takes place. You don't have to be pretty, you don't have to be handsome, you don't have to, but a smile, it'll decorate you and... The, Embellish you no matter who you are. Make your facial expression much more beautiful. And then a keen sense of justice toward all people. Now, a keen sense of justice. In other words, uh, being just with another person, even when it's uh, to your disadvantage to do so. What a wonderful thing that is, and how that does endear you to other people, when they know very well that your being just with them is costing you something. Do it. There's no particular uh, virtue in being just with the other fellow when you're benefiting by it. 
And do you know how? Do you have any idea how many people there are that are just fair and just and honest only when they uh, when they know it's uh, going to come back to them in one way or another? How quickly they'd be dishonest if it is un if it was profitable to them to do it? Well, I wouldn't give you the percentage. I'd hate to tell you what I think it is. It's much too high. People who are like that, keen sense of justice toward all people at all times, and then next one, sincerity of purpose. Uh, nobody likes a person who is obviously insincere in what he says and does. Who's trying to be something that he's not. Who's saying something that doesn't represent his inner thoughts and you know that's true. It's not as bad as out and out lying, but it's the, it's the first cousin to it. Lacking of sincerity of purpose. Then versatility. Uh, a wide range of knowledge of people and the world events outside of one's immediate personal interest. You take a person who doesn't know anything about, except about one thing and you... You'll find a person that will be boresome the moment he gets out of that field. Now you can, you don't have to use your imagination very much to think of somebody that you know of that uh, he lives, he, he's got his nose so closely to the grindstone in some one thing that he knows nothing about anything that's going on outside of that. And he'll, ha he'll not be interesting as a conversationalist nor in any other way unless he has a, a wide enough range of things generally to be able to talk to you about the things that interest you. You know the best way in the world to make yourself liked by other people? Yes, talk. Talk to them about the things that interest them. That's it. And incidentally, if you talk to the other fellow about things that inter interest him, when you get around to talking about things that interest you, he'll be a receptive listener, much more so. And then uh, tactfulness in speech and manner. Now, you don't have to... Uh, in your speech and in your manner, you don't have to reflect by your mental attitude, by your words, everything that goes on in your mind. If you do that, why, everybody, you'll be an open book and everybody can read you at will. And some of them, sometimes they'll read you when you wish they hadn't. Tactfulness in your speech and in your attitude toward other people. You can always be tactful. You know, like uh, drivers on the road when the other fellow skins your fenders and you know how tactful they are when they jump out and run around to see how much damage is done. Maybe 10 cents where the paint's been knocked off and they do a hundred dollars worth of damage cussing one another out. No, some of these days I'm going to have the experience of seeing two fellows collide on the highway and they're going to jump out and apologize, each one claiming it was his fault and wanting to pay the bill. And I do. I don't know what's going to happen to them, but I'm going to see that some of these days. <laughs> Tactfulness. You'd be surprised how much you can do with people if you're just tactful with them. Oftentimes, instead of telling people to do things or asking them to do things, uh, requesting them to do things or demanding them to do things, it might be very tactful and helpful if you requested them and asked them if they would mind doing things. Even though you're in authority to give them an instruction, it's still better to ask if they would mind doing certain things. I, one of the most outstanding employers I ever knew, ever gave a, any of his employees direct instructions. That was Andrew Carnegie. He always asked his associates and his employees, even the humblest, if they would mind doing something for him. Or would it be convenient? Or would it be suitable? Never ordered them to do anything. But asked them always. No wonder he got along so well with people. No wonder he was so successful. Then the promptness of decision. Now, nobody can be, uh, be very well liked and have a very pleasing personality who always puts off making a decision when he has all of the facts before him and ought to make the decision right on the spot. I don't mean by that they should go off half cock, they should make, render snap judgments, but when they have all of the facts and the time has arrived for a decision, get in the habit of making those decisions. And if you make one that's wrong, you can always reverse it and don't be too big to, uh, or, or too little <laughs> to reverse yourself when you find out that you should reverse yourself. There's a great advantage in being fair enough with yourself and with the other fellow to reverse yourself if you've made the wrong decision. And of course, I don't need to make much comment on number 13, faith in infinite intelligence. You know what your faith is there. And you should rate very high. If you are following your religion, whatever it is, faithfully, you should rate very high on that one. But you'd be surprised how many people there are that give lip service to this question of faith in infinite intelligence and don't do very much about uh, outside of lip service. And this lip service is not, is not so loud that you can hear it very far away. They don't, uh, they don't indulge in any very outstanding acts backing up their alleged belief in infinite intelligence. I don't know how the Creator feels about it, but you know, I believe that one act, uh, an ounce of acts, is worth a million tons of good intentions.
or belief, but just one act. Number 14, appropriateness of words. They're free from slang and wisecracks and profanity. I never saw an age when uh, people indulge in so many uh, uh, wisecracks, slang statements, uh, double talk, and all that sort of thing. And it may seem smart to the fellow who's doing it, but it's not smart to the fellow who's listening. He may laugh at it, but he's not going to be impressed with a fellow that engages too much in these wisecracks. Smart sayings. Appropriateness of words. Our English language is not the easiest thing in the world to, to conquer or to master, but uh, it is a beautiful language and has a wide range of, um, of words, meanings, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to control the English language so that you can convey to the other fellow precisely what you have in your mind or what you want him to think you have in mind, what you want him to know. Then the controlled enthusiasm. You'd say, well, why controlled enthusiasm? Why not turn it loose and let it run riot? Well, just because you'll get in danger, into trouble if you do. Your enthusiasm ought to be handled very much like you handle your electricity. Now, it's a very wonderful thing. It washes dishes, washes your clothes, runs the toaster, maybe cooks your food on the stove, does a lot of things, but you handle it with care. And uh, you, you turn it on when you want it, and then turn it off when you don't want it. Your enthusiasm should be handled with just as much care. You turn it on when you want to uh, turn it on, and then you can just as quickly turn it off. If you're not able to turn it off as quickly as you turn it on, somebody will come along and get you all enthused over something that you ought not to be enthused over. <laughs> Did you ever hear that happening? And boy, what a sucker you will be at that time for his prey, whatever he wants to do. You can be too enthusiastic with the other fellow where you wear him out. Wear him out pulling down his metal shades and resisting you. I have had salesmen come around so enthusiastic that I wouldn't let them in my place a second time because I didn't want to go to the trouble of defending myself against them. I've heard some speakers, I've heard some preachers like that too. I wouldn't want to follow them because I had too much trouble resisting them. <laughs> I don't get any notions. <laughs> you know the type I'm talking about. The fellow just absolutely turns his uh, enthusiasm battery loose and goes off and leaves it. And you, all you can do is to run away from it or try and turn it off. And the man that does that's not going to be popular. But the man who can turn on his enthusiasm at the right time, the right amount, and then turn it off at the right time, that's the man that's going to be considered uh, to have a pleasing personality. And incidentally, if you're not able to... Uh, to exude enthusiasm when you want to, you certainly are not going to be considered a, a pleasing personality because there are times when you definitely need it in teaching or in lecturing or in speaking or in ordinary conversation or in selling or almost anything that you're doing in human relationships requires a certain amount of enthusiasm at times. And enthusiasm is one of those things you can cultivate. It's uh, just like all these other qualities. There's only one quality in here that you can't cultivate. I'll see if you can find it. It was the one that Andrew Carnegie said he could give you every one of the others except that one. Personal magnetism. Personal magnetism, that's right, exactly. You've got just so much of that, even that, that's subject to control and to transmutation too. But that's something that one person can't give to another. Now, um, control enthusiasm, and then uh, good clean sportsmanship. Uh, being a sportsman about everything, uh, you're not going to win all the time in life. Nobody can do that. There are going to be times when you lose. Uh, when you lose, lose uh, gracefully and graciously. Lose and say, well, I lost, but I, uh, maybe it's the best thing that I did because I'm going to start looking immediately for that seed of an equivalent benefit, and next time, uh, when time comes to lose, I'm going to let somebody else lose. <laughs> so I'm going to wise myself up. And then uh, don't take it too seriously, no matter what it is. You know, during the Depression, I had four of my friends commit suicide. About two of them jumped off of tall buildings, one shot himself, and another one took poison <clears throat> because they lost their money. And I, the two of them, at least, I lost twice as much as they did. And I didn't jump off in the building, I didn't shoot myself, I didn't poison myself. What did I do? I said, well, it's a blessed fine thing because uh, losing this amount of money now, I'll have to start in and earn some more. And in earning some more, I'll learn some more. There's my mental attitude toward it was that I started immediately looking for that Stephen and the cool, but didn't disturb me in the least. 
And I said to myself, if I lose every penny that I have, like the last suit I have, even my DVDs, I can always get a barrel from somebody <laughs> and start in all over again. Wherever I can get a bunch of people together to listen, I'll be able to start making money. Now you can't, how are you going to down a person with that kind of an attitude? No matter how many times he's defeated, he'll come right up again. Just like a cork, you can put him down under water, but he can bounce up the moment you take your hand off of him. And if you don't take your hand off, he'll make you take it off. And then uh, this one down here, number 17, common courtesy. Oh, what a marvelous thing that is. Just common, ordinary garden variety of courtesy toward everybody. People, especially toward people that are obviously on a of a lower plane socially or economically or financially than yourself. What a wonderful thing it is to be courteous to the person to whom you don't have to be courteous. It's a wonderful thing. It does something to the other fellow and it does something to you. I, I always hate to see anybody lording it over another person. Nothing, nothing gets me uh, upset quicker than to go into a restaurant and have some newly rich or somebody come in and start ordering the waiters around and abusing them. Even sometimes they may deserve it, but I still, I, I have never learned to like that. I've always thought that anybody that would abuse another person in public, with or without a cause, had something wrong with his machinery, and that something is missing in life, and you would be sure that there is something he's missing. I remember so well, when I was living at the Bellevue Stratford in Hotel in Philadelphia, on that famous trip when I went there to get my publisher the first time, one of the waiters spilled some hot soup right on, right on the back of my neck. And I mean it burned me too. Well, the head waiter ran over and a little while the manager of the hotel was out there and uh, he wanted to get a doctor. I said, well, it's not that serious after all. The waiter spilled a little soup. Uh, if he hadn't spilled it, I'd have gone down my neck. Now, uh, maybe I won't have to take it. Well, he said, we'll have, the, we'll have your suit clean and we'll uh, do this, we'll do that, and do that. I said, no, I'm just don't get upset. I'm, not, I'm the one to get upset, and I'm not getting upset about it. And that waiter afterward, <clears throat> after he was off duty, he came up to my room and he said, I want to tell you how much I appreciated what you said. You could have had me fired. He said, I was just as good as fired, and if you hadn't talked about the way you did, I'd have been out. And he said, I couldn't afford to be fired. Well, I don't know how much good it did the waiter, but it did mean a lot of good. No, that after all, I, there was a man I could have humiliated. As far as I know, I have never intentionally in my whole life humiliated anybody for anything whatsoever. Never, as far as I know. I may have done it unintentionally. And uh, I feel good to be able to say that. I feel good to have that attitude toward people. And you know, it, uh, it comes back to me because the people have that attitude toward me too. They don't want to humiliate me. Why? Because you get back from people by what you send out. You're a human magnet and you're attracting to you the sum and the substance of what goes on in your heart and soul. Then the uh, appropriateness of personal adornment. Uh, that's important to anybody in public life. Now, I have never been too fussy about that. I've never used formal clothes on, except on very few occasions. Uh, formal clothes are time, however, when it's appropriate, perfectly appropriate uh, for you to adjust and, uh, and have. But ordinarily, if you use good taste, and ordinarily the, the best dressed person is the one that's dressed so that uh, if you were told to describe what, how he, he or she was dressed later on, you couldn't do it. You'd say, all I know was he looked nice or she looked nice. Appropriateness of personal adornment, then good showmanship. Uh, you've got to be a showman if you're going to sell yourself in any walk of life. You've got to be a, be a good showman. Know when to dramatize uh, words, when to dramatize circumstances. You know, there are certain things, if you describe them in just ordinary language, you take the history of the most outstanding man in the world, and if you just gave the bare facts and didn't dramatize them as you went along, why, well, you'd fall down flat. You really would. You've got to dramatize these things that you're talking about and these people that you're doing business with. You've got to learn the art of showmanship as you go along. And it's something you can learn. And then I don't need to mention to you that you should have the habit of going the extra mile. We've uh, spent a whole evening on that and you've got a whole lesson on that. Uh, and certainly you can rate yourself on that. And then on temperance in eating, drinking, work and play and in thinking. Temperance, uh, that means not too much, not too little of anything. Do yourself just as much damage with eating as you can with drinking liquor. Just as much. 
Uh, the rule that I go by in all, all these things is that I don't allow anything to take charge of me. When I was smoking, um, when I got to the point where the cigars were smoking me, then I quit. I can take a cocktail, I can take two. I, I guess I could take three. I don't remember ever having taken more than that in a social evening, but I could if I wanted to. But if I ever found them taking me, or if I ever found my being able to resist them, I'd part company with them in a hurry. I would say I'd follow the same rule if I were smoking again now. And when I got to the point where the cigars were smoking me, I did. I quit. Quit right off. I want to be in possession of Napoleon Hill all the time. Not too much, not too little. Temperance. Temperance, it's a marvelous thing. There's nothing so very bad in life, don't you know, if you don't overdo it. Then the patience, under all circumstances. Patience. You have to have patience in this world we're living. It's a world of competition. You're constantly being called upon to use your patience. And to t by using patience, you learn to time these things so that uh, you uh, get action out of other people at the time when, it's more, when the time is more favorable. But if you don't have patience, you can try to force the hand of other people. You'll get a no or you get a turn down or a knockdown when you don't want it. <laughs> patience requires, uh, you, you require patience in order that you may time your relationships with people. And you have to have a lot of patience. You have to be able to... Uh, Control yourself at all times. Most people don't have much patience, you know. You can make, uh, you take the average person, take the majority of people, you can make them mad in two seconds. All you've got to do is say the wrong thing. Or do the wrong thing. Why, well, yeah, I don't need to be, uh, get angry because somebody says or does the wrong thing. I could if I want to, but it's my choice. I can choose not to get mad. Number 23, gracefulness in posture and carriage of the body. Now, if I came in and go like this, of course I'd be very comfortable, that's much easier. But it's finer for me to stand up like this, look like I can stand straight without leaning on anything. Slump around and uh, be careless in your posture. Marchi is one who is not uh, very particular about his own personal appearance and so forth. It's a good idea to have gracefulness and posture and carriage of the body.